ladies and gentlemen, we we might uh, we might try and get proceedings underway. Look, um, thank you very much. We've had a few little technical issues here, but I think we've mastered them, um, which will leave 10 minutes now for the talk, which is which is fine. Um, look, it's the 29th plenary uh, speech today, presentation today, and in that time, we've brought people from all over Australia to, to talk to us, and uh, also 12 homegrown uh, individuals who we've uh, been able to entice to come and give this talk. So uh, on this occasion, Toby Coates um, is, uh, one of our homegrown individuals, and we're delighted to have him here. Um, Toby is um, is probably well known to many of you. He's um, a clinical professor in medicine at the University of Adelaide. He's got his PhD from the University of Adelaide, um, and um, uh, did it down at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, and then headed off to the uh, University of Pittsburgh, where he worked in the Thomas Starzl Transplantation Institute. And Tom Starzl was a surgeon, uh, the pioneer of liver transplantation, and um, uh, so, you know, he's relied heavily as, as in his career on surgeons to get him where he is. Um, he's now um, uh, directing the transplant program at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, and we've sent him up there really, as I was saying at morning tea, to do sort of missionary work for the Royal Adelaide um, uh, to try and spread the word. And the BHI has for a long time been an incubator of really outstanding research. And um, the renal transplant um, program and renal medicine has been certainly here, as you would, many of you would know, we did the first renal transplant in Australia here at the Queen Elizabeth. And it really was um, the home of um, renal transplantation until uh, political decisions were made that really made no sense. But that's a, that's a long time ago. Um, he's, um, he's has over 150 peer reviewed publications, has brought in vast sums of money. And in fact, um, maybe the government should be looking at him to um, try and get itself out of its current uh, funding problem. Uh, but uh, over $70 million in research funding, which is an extraordinary effort for anyone. Um, his um, laboratory group are involved in all sorts of things, but I think this whole issue of transplantation, renal transplantation, pancreas transplantation, uh, to make these things work, you do have to work with a lot of colleagues. You do have to work with um, uh, surgeons, you have to work with administrations, you have to work with research institutes, whole raft of things. and. Uh, Toby Coates is an absolute superstar at doing that. He tr liaises tremendously well with people. And I think that's where the great strength has come from. Not only is he obviously a very well-positioned scientist, but he's also um, able to bring forces to focus on difficult and challenging issues. And uh, the work in his um, uh, renal, uh, not renal, um, uh, pancreatic work has been fantastic. So Toby, it's a great, Pleasure to have you here today. Um, we are all very keen to hear what you have to tell us about recycling islets to treat diabetes. And um, I think that, and I do hope that he's going to allow enough time for some questions at the end so we can at least interrogate um, some of the work he's currently doing. Thank you very much. Hi, and uh, it's uh, very much a great pleasure to be, to be back here where indeed my scientific uh, and renal career started. Uh, and so um, I guess uh, uh, another thing that Guy and I have in common, apart from the fact that we're both uh, mad keen Port Adelaide football supporters, uh, is the fact that I believe both of us were born at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital when we used to uh, have an obstetrics unit here. So I really go all the way back, um, everything. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start with this and I hope it will play. We'll see how we go. An Adelaide boy's undergone an Australian first transplant. Seven-year-old Gary Wanganine suffered from hereditary pancreatitis and had to rely on strong painkillers until his mum found the surgery on a Facebook forum. His pancreas was removed and sent to Melbourne, where islets were extracted, the cells were returned to Adelaide and infused into his liver the same day. When you don't have much other choices, you don't really, you've got to wing it and give it a go. And I didn't think that would have a problem with recovery at all because he's a little fighter. Gary plans to tell his friends he was bitten by a shark when he returns to school. It's a chronic uh, abdominal condition uh, that lasts typically greater than six months uh, and has a variety of morphological characteristics when we when we look at them with imaging techniques. For example, calcification in the pancreas, uh, we often find that there are significant uh, uh, um, 
structural abnormalities in the pancreas if you do any RCP, the ducts are uh, damaged and it produces extremely severe abdominal pain. Um, at the end, if uh, you don't treat it uh, appropriately, uh, you end up with what we call endocrine and exocrine uh, insufficiency so that you're unable to produce the enzymes that enable you to digest your food and then ultimately you're unable to produce the hormone insulin which enables you to absorb the food um, from, from your blood. So it's, it is a significant problem uh, that, that exists in our community. Um, and it's interesting because, I, as Guy said, I'm a transplant immunologist by training. Uh, and when I got interested in, in dealing with the pancreas, I was looking at uh, how all of these events happen. And many of the processes that happen within the pancreas are exactly the same as what happens within a transplant when a transplant is actually rejecting. So it's the same basic underlying process, but applied to a different organ. And, and the more you do in medicine, the more you realise that many of the processes we deal with are common across multiple organ systems. So for example, when you have the healthy, normal pancreas sitting up here, surrounded by these, these stellate cells, which are sort of cells that uh, patrol the immune system, you provide some insults, such as typically alcohol and tobacco, you get recruitment of inflammatory cells, these cells become activated and you start to develop a process uh, of chronic inflammation around the lobule uh, of the pancreas, pancreatic duct. And then uh, ultimately you end up getting fibrosis, you get more cells being uh, uh, recruited in there, what we call oxidative stress, and this produces the chronically damaged and scarred and inflamed pancreas that, that I'm going to show you through the rest of, rest of the talk. And ultimately, if left untreated, you end up getting a duct obstruction and portal duct, uh, pancreatic duct hyper, uh, hypertension and severe abdominal pain and a great disruption to life. If we drill down at it even, even closer, um, the disease that we're going to talk a lot about today is a rare disease, which is called uh, the PRSS1 uh, genetic cause pancreatitis. Uh, and this is a defect in an enzyme, which is called the cationic uh, trypsinogen pathway, or in the cationic trypsinogen pathway. And these uh, enzymes are important in, in producing uh, the, the material, the, the enzymes to digest the food as it comes through uh, in, into the stomach. I won't go through this in any great detail, but here this is really, um, if I, I could put this slide into a transplant talk and everything there, all the mechanisms that we are used to dealing with in transplantation when we perform an organ transplant. Damage associated molecular patterns, release of double-stranded DNA antibodies, HMGB1, um, toll-like receptors, everything. Everything that's in the, in the rejecting graft is in the pancreas when it's being inflamed and under attack. So these uh, gene mutations that we're going to talk about today, as I say, they're rare and they're associated with a significant degree of either overactivation of these enzymes or underactivation and loss of degradation products. The end, re end result of which is a chronically inflamed organ sitting in the back of your stomach, which causes a lot of pain and produces a lot of problems. Um, in the normal pancreas, uh, we have trypsinogen, which is con converted to trypsin, uh, and gene defects or hereditary abnormalities here, either in the SPINK1 pathway or in the trypsin pathway, or in this one, which is the cystic fibrosis transport, transport pathway, have all been implicated in these causes of hereditary, of the hereditary pancreatitis, which you'll see a little bit more about in a minute when I describe the families that have been affected. And so um, you can either have too much trypsin produced or too little trypsin produced, um, and all of this is under control of this particular nasty gene here called PRSS1. And the bottom line with this is that um, when these things accumulate within the pancreas, we start to get autodigestion. That is, the, the organ itself starts to dissolve itself from the inside out, which you can appreciate would be an extremely painful and very unpleasant thing to have happen to you. So um, you'll see in a minute, um, and as I go through the case of how this actually happened, why I ended up getting interested uh, in this. Um, this is just one pedigree of one South Australian family. And the thing about uh, these gene defects is, if you leave them long enough, if you have a chronically inflamed pancreas for long enough, uh, that pancreas will develop a malignancy. And uh, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, as Professor Madden would know, has got a dreadful prognosis, about an 8% uh, five-year survival. And it doesn't matter what stage you get it at, it's 8%. So the treatments that we have for pancreas cancer are extremely poor. And so this is a condition which can produce cancer of the pancreas in people as early as 40. So you'd appreciate that's in the middle of their productive life. Uh, and if we could do something about that to prevent that from becoming a problem, um, that would be a significant thing that we could do. These genes are also inherited in what we call a dominant matter, manner. And what I mean by that is that every generation is affected. And that's what this pedigree shows you here. So the little um, red uh, uh, 
quadrangles here, um, show this family here, one, two, three generations affected. Down the bottom here, uh, these are the children uh, of this particular person over here. Uh, and this person has got one, two, three members, three of her children <laughs> affected with this problem, which typically starts um, in infancy. So usually around the age of two or three, uh, extending all the way into, into early adult life. Uh, and it's a much underappreciated problem. And I'll talk to you about some of the social aspects that go around the outside of this at the end, and you'll see why, why I think it's uh, such an interesting thing to be involved with. So the pancreas gene incidence uh, is anywhere between uh, five and about 8% uh, higher in the general population per year. And if you look at it over the lifespan of a whole individual, let's say we get them to 75, um, the risk of developing a, can a cancer of the pancreas, uh, if you've got this particular gene, is equivalent to the BRCA1 gene. And you all know the money and the, uh, and the, the, the important money and the important research that goes into uh, BRCA and breast cancer. But this gene has probably a very similar uh, impact, but is much less well known. And therefore, again, I think a reason that we need to, we need to study it further. The other thing that you'll see when we talk about the patients at the end uh, is that this is a disease that has a huge burden on the families, uh, on, their, on patients, the families and society as whole, because these uh, chronic abdominal pain issues uh, cause the biggest problem in your most productive early ages. So there's disruption to school, there's disruption to all of the things that we would normally expect uh, people to be getting on with their lives. So I want to show you what it actually looks like. So um, in, this is pancreatitis down here on the left hand side and also on the right hand side and in the middle I've got a normal pancreas and the normal pancreas in the middle you see these beautiful cells here which are called the islet cells and that's how I've sort of come into this because as Guy indicated um, my background is in, in, uh, in islet cell transplantation for the treatment of type 1 diabetes. And what you'll notice when you look at the pancreatitis on either side is that although the uh, exocrine tissue uh, is very heavily scarred, the islets are quite preserved. And so they sit here, and you can see them down here at the bottom, you can see them here, despite in a sea of fibrosis, these cells are still alive and viable. And when you look at patients with chronic pancreatitis, what you actually see is most of them don't end up becoming diabetic. And that is because the pancreatic islet has 10%, only being 1% of the, the uh, cells in the pancreas, has got 10% of the blood supply. So it's the islets actually stay right towards the end. They don't die early, they're still there. And that's why they're of, they're of interest, interest to me, because they're potentially viable. Now, when we do a whole organ pancreas transplant, which is a program that we've started uh, up at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, um, this is the beautiful... Uh, pancreas that we would get, the typical pancreas that you'd expect to see. Um, and that is a very healthy looking pancreas. These pancreases that you can see down the side here are the sort that Guy and the team down here would deal with, chronically inflamed, very badly damaged, red, angry, nasty looking organs. And you can appreciate that if that's sitting in your, your abdomen being inflamed, that's not gonna be a happy, happy situation at all. So the process, and I don't know whether this one will work either, doesn't look like it's going to. Apologies about this. Uh, what this would have shown you uh, is the, the concept that we've got here today is the idea of taking the pancreas out of the person with the pancreatitis, digesting the islets out, which is something that we've been doing for treatment of type 1 diabetes, and then infusing the islets back into the liver of the person that's got the pancreatitis. And of course, because they're the person's own cells, there's no immunity bar barrier to overcome. So you don't have the problem that we've got uh, with either a whole pancreas or with uh, an islet cell transplant of having to deal with having to deal with the immune system and trying to dampen it down. So in terms of a cellular transplant, as an auto transplant, it's uh, actually a, a really good thing to actually do. Now, guys, the guy did quite correctly indicate that I have been working, I would say, for surgeons all of my life. Um, so this is these uh, procedures were first developed uh, in. The United States, and this came from Minnesota, uh, the first pancreatectomy and island auto transplant. Uh, and that's Donald Sutherland down there, who uh, did the first one back in 1974. And they've got a huge amount of experience um, in doing this. Uh, I'm going to show you their, their insulin independence, independence results because I want you to note this because when I get to the end and show you ours, because frankly, ours are better. So they get about 32% of their patients off insulin when they, when they do this. Uh, most of them uh, will have C-peptide, that's the hormone that the islet cells make, indicating that the transplanted cells are surviving and, and viable. Um, most of them are able to get uh, their patients off, off the opioids because that's the other, the other thing about this, is the impact of this treatment in terms of reducing the dependence on opioids and the impact on society. And that's why it's something that, that we think it's a, a very, very useful thing for us to be investing here in South Australia. 
So there are a variety of procedures that can be performed. Um, I'll show you, I'll, I'll keep it very straightforward and simple. Um, essentially, you can uh, do the total pancreatectomy and island auto transplant with or without preservation of the spleen, depending on, on how you want to do this. The, um, the argument for preserving the spleen, particularly in children, when we do this uh, operation, is there's a huge amount of immunity that's left in the spleen, and we want to keep that if we possibly can. The disadvantage of preserving the spleen is that the pancreas runs right up to the, to the tip of the spleen. And so if you've got an inflamed, inflamed pancreas, you've usually got an inflamed spleen as well. And you can spend a lot of time trying to dissect that out. The longer you have to get the pancreas out, um, the less islets you're going to get back at the other end. So it's a trade-off between whether you preserve the immunity and whether you get the pancreas out quickly. And as you'll see, to get it on the plane, to get it to Melbourne, to get the cells isolated, to get them back, which you'll see, which you'll see in a second. So in some places, what we'll actually do is take the spleen out, chop the spleen up into little bits and inject it back into the abdomen, uh, which is another, another way that you can, you can deal with that. Ultimately, once you've got the islet cells isolated, you then, uh, in a bag, infuse them back into the portal vein of the person who uh, requires the islet cell transplant, and they, the uh, insulin production uh, ensues from there. Now, Guy was quite right. Um, this is a multidisciplinary team, and my role in this is actually extremely small. Um, so they're gastroenterologists, surgeons, endocrine people. Uh, we have the islet transplant team. We have an excellent pain management team uh, who are based here at the Queen Elizabeth. So there's a Queen Elizabeth Hospital component to this. Uh, the main surgeon uh, the, uh, is our liver transplant surgeon, John Chen, who comes from the Royal Adelaide and from Glinda's Medical Centre. And there's clearly a role for social workers and, and coordinators, because this is quite a logistic issue, which you'll see as I show you. There are a variety of tests that we'll do on these people before we do these procedures. Uh, and that is we want to be sure that we're taking the pancreas out of somebody for the right reasons. And so that will involve uh, endoscopic ultrasounds and Nam Nguyen up at the Royal Adelaide is uh, one of Australia's best people at doing this, very good at this. Magnetic resonance imaging, which I'm showing you here, uh, and uh, imaging of the duct um, to make sure that the, that the pancreas is in fact uh, intact. One of the problems that we've got is that the more interventions that you do on the pancreas, um, the greater the chance of the pancreas becoming colonized by bacteria from the gut. And that has caused us a significant problems after when we do this pr uh, procedure, because once you've isolated the cells, if you've got gut contamination in there, you've got nasty bugs that are there ready to be infused into the liver of somebody. And we've had people become quite unwell uh, when we've done this, so it, so it is important. After you do this operation, um, the approximate stay can be between 10 and 14 days, usually two or three days uh, in the intensive care unit. The most recent uh, two that we've done in adults at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, we had out at eight days. So we're uh, achieving this uh, in under the time that, that's required to be done. We run an insulin infusion uh, because we want to uh, rest the islet cells whilst they're embedding in their new home uh, and we have very tight blood glucose control. And that's something that we learn from doing transplants um, uh, for type 1 diabetes. We have long-acting insulin on board and then also short-acting insulin. The pain unit comes and advises us on how we're going to deal with, uh, uh, how, the, how we're going to deal with the pain. Uh, and usually that's a, by PCA. We do a liver ultrasound very early on because we're infusing cells into the liver. And the biggest complication that we can get is a portal vein thrombosis. And if you get that, you need liver transplant. So we try to avoid doing that if we possibly can. And so we anticoagulate these people therapeutically as well. So it's a risky business when you do this. And so you don't rush into these operations unless you, you absolutely have to. And then we discharge them when their pain is under control and they've got stable insulin dosing and they're tolerating, tolerating food. And as I say, the last two adults we did, we got out in uh, seven and eight days respectively, which I was very, very pleased about. So what's in it for society? Uh, these are people that are greatly disabled by pain uh, and they're usually opioid dependent. Uh, and what you'll see here, and this is data from uh, Ashley De uh, Dennison, who's been a, a supporter of our program from the word go, from, from the University of Leicester. Um, he's able to get virtually uh, most of his people, at least 37% of his people off insulin um, at, at 12 months. So he's been getting very good results as well in terms of uh, giving enough islets back to make sure that you've got enough to remain, to remain insulin independent. The Minnesota experience is very, very similar. Um, they have uh, a difference in terms of uh, how many people get off different types of insulin. But the most impressive thing in their very large series is at least 90% of the patients who've had this procedure undertaken in the States said they would absolutely do it again, which is important. So patient selection is very important. And the rule on this is first do no harm. And that's why we've developed a multidisciplinary team that crosses all three hospitals and the women's and children's to appropriately assess these patients before we go ahead and do them. It costs a lot of money. Now, we don't know exactly how much it costs in Australia at the moment, but I do have a very talented uh, honours student 
who for the last 20 months has been doing data linkage with uh, SANT data linkage. Uh, and we have now got the complete record of every patient in South Australia who's had pancreatitis back to 1890 uh, with their entire uh, health record mapped to this data set. And what that's going to give us, what that will give us uh, is the exact, the precise costs for what this costs, this condition costs us here in South Australia. Even better than that, we've also got as controls all of the type one diabetics that, that have been uh, diagnosed in South Australia. So we'll have data, never been done before, we'll have data that will tell us exactly how many hospital admissions, how many procedures, how many operations, how many days missed school, because all of these are linked in, in SANT data link, they're all linked in uh, to this big database. So we'll be able to actually, for the first time, accurately work, measure the impact of what this condition does. And not only that, but we'll be able to look at what type one diabetes does. And why that's important is the cost of this procedure is trivial compared to the, the amount of distress and the pain and the hospital impact. But you've got to have the numbers to prove it. And if you haven't got the numbers to prove it, no one will believe you. So that's, that's where we're going with that. So he's working on that now. And I had really hoped I was going to have that for you today, but as usual, uh, it's a little bit like my computer it didn't work. So uh, maybe the next time I do this talk. Anyway, if we look at what's the cost is in the UK, um, it's huge. Uh, these are old figures, 2014, that Ashley gave me. In the UK, you know, half a billion pounds. Uh, in the US, probably uh, three, three and a half billion uh, US dollars. So a lot of money to, to treat this condition. What about opiates? Opiates are a big problem. They're a huge problem, but you all know that. Um, opiate independence uh, can be achieved very nicely by this procedure. If you can remove the inflamed organ and you, and you spend the time and you work with people, you're able to actually get them off. And this is Ashley's beautiful data that shows that 15 years, 100%, everybody who had, they've done this procedure on in Leicester has come off opiates, which I think is an absolute huge achievement and a testament to the really good quality program that Ashley runs. So we did do, you would have seen Jane tell you about this, but uh, you have me telling you about you instead. So this was the first one we did. Uh, this is, uh, and this is in the advertiser, it's been published very widely, so it's all used with permission. So this is uh, little Gary Wanganine over here, uh, who had his pancreas removed at the age of seven. Um, if you'd asked me at the time, uh, was I going to be allowed to do a procedure that has never been done in Australia before on an Aboriginal child, I would have laughed at you and said, absolutely no way but uh, we were able to get the women's and children's on site after about 18 months uh, and do it. And the, the truth was his mother here, Chanel, um, she found this surgery on a Facebook uh, forum, uh, connected with people in the United States, worked out that this was the most appropriate treatment for her son and basically badgered the women's and children's to a point where they agreed to fund it and do it. So it's proof that the power of one can, can actually achieve things. She's a remarkable, remarkable woman. I'd also like to acknowledge here, in case I don't do it at the end, uh, Chris Drogamuller, who's our principal islet scientist. There is a very strong need to have uh, research scientists in, embedded in hospitals. Uh, and the fact that they've been allowed to disappear from hospitals is a shame, in my opinion. Uh, we need research scientists attached to be able to do things. And Chris is our research scientist. Tony Radford's our islet nurse there. And they've been involved with the program all, all the way through. So it'll be my pitch to anybody here who might have influence that we should bring back more scientists into the hospital. So little Gary, um, he had this uh, PRSS1 gene that I told you about. Um, you can see what he was on. He was uh, seven years and eight months of when he did this, 21 kilograms, which is not very heavy. Um, so he's taking amitriptyline, um, some uh, omeprazole, creon, oxycodone, and, and gabapentin. None of that stuff should be taken by seven-year-olds. Absolutely not. And, but he was on that to control the pain. I mentioned his father had the same gene, and his father underwent a pancreatectomy at the age of 40 uh, without islet transplantation because that didn't, technology didn't exist until we started the islet program uh, at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. He's also got a younger brother who is uh, uh, affected with the same condition. Very hard to read this, but what I want to point out to you is uh, the impact of this condition on this individual. This is the timeline here between 2011 and 2015. And all of these red stars here are admissions to the Women's and Children's Hospital or admissions to Flinders Medical Center. The gene we identified back, way back here, right at the beginning, but we weren't able to do anything about it till right over here. So you could again appreciate that lag time that it takes to actually get things to happen. Um, in the yellow bar, this is uh, pancreatic exocrine enzyme replacement. So this is the creon. So his pancreas in terms of secreting the, all of those digestive enzymes had failed very, very, very early on. So he was really, didn't really have an organ that was doing him very much good other than controlling his blood sugars. And you can see here the oxycodone starts just after 2012. So again, a huge impact on this particular individual. 
The most impressive thing uh, is that now post this uh, admission, he's uh, post this uh, procedure in the last five years, he's had two admissions to hospital. So a huge impact. To do this surgery um, is a huge team effort, as Guy said, um, and it crosses all sorts of, uh, everybody gets involved. Um, to do this, we, we have to start the anesthesia at 5.15 in the morning, uh, so very, very early, so the surgeons have to come in early to, to get things going, all the, open up the theatres. Pancreatectomy usually starts about six um, in the morning. John Chen, this particular one was done by John Sanjeev Karana from the uh, Women's and Children, and Chris Russell, who's our transplant uh, surgeon from Royal Adelaide. We then package the pancreas up and we into University of Wisconsin solution and shipped it or ship it to Melbourne. And we do that via a commercial flight, believe it or not. Um, so it's packed up. So we have to time everything so that we can actually catch the flights. Now you can appreciate in the COVID times, we've not been able to do any of these procedures because we haven't got the ability until late, until soon, I hope, to do these isolations here in South Australia. So it's yet another reason why we need to be developing these technologies. The islets are then isolated, and I'll show you some pictures about that, and that's quite a complicated procedure. And then return to Adelaide by commercial flight. Um, we uh, reinfuse them into the patient uh, on, on the same day via a portal vein uh, catheter. And that usually, the, the infusion, the, the transplant bit of it's actually trivial compared to the isolation bit of it. Uh, and it usually finishes about 10 o'clock at night, and then we all go to the lion. I'm not joking, we all go to the lion with a beer when it's all done with uh, everyone who's been involved. This is what, the, what it looks like. Here's the theatre uh, theater starting at five o'clock in the morning and there's John and, and Chris involved in this particular operation. That's what uh, the pancreas look like. That does not look like the pancreas I showed you earlier on. That is a horribly fibrotic and scarred uh, piece of calcium. Basically, it's a rock. And we were uh, actually quite pessimistic that we'd get any islets out of it whatsoever. Uh, we've cannulated the duct here, so to, to get the enzyme, the islets out, you have to break this up um, with uh, uh, some very heavy enzymes themselves to dissect the tissue and, and break it down. Um, this is done in the clean room. Uh, this is a picture of the clean room at St Vincent's Institute. There's the pancreas, and you basically come in from either side. So it's a clean room in a box, which is much the best way to do things. You don't need a gigantic clean room where everybody has to be sterile, you know, like something in a nuclear power plant. You actually need a very small area to do what you need to do, and that's what this uh, uh, the biospherics chamber actually does. It's a very effective way, cutting edge way of doing these things. Here's this pancreas, which we've dissected up into these little tiny chunks. And we, because we couldn't infuse it, we just had to squirt the enzyme on the top and just hope that it would, that it would break down. You then take the, what you've got and you put it into essentially a cocktail shaker, and that's called a recording chamber. And that's what I'm showing you on the screen there. That's got a giant, it's got glass marbles in it. And literally you agitate it like Tom Cruise. You do that for about 16 minutes. That dissociates the islet cells from the, the, the asana tissue. Uh, and then you can collect them and purify them to be able to transplant them. They go back into a little lunchbox and an esky that looks exactly like that. And then we pop them on a plane and we fly them back. At the same time, when I know that the plane has landed, because we've done this a lot of times now, when the plane has landed at Adelaide Airport, I get a text from Chris, who goes across, Chris Drogamal, and does all these procedures. He says, we've landed. I say, okay, we'll get the patient down. So the patient's down in the, in the theatre then, we've got them asleep, and then the ra interventional radiologists have cannulated the portal vein so that the minute the hospital, the islets arrive, either at the Women's and Children's or at the Royal Adelaide, we can infuse the cells straight away, so there's, there's, there's no downtime. And again, the beautiful thing is this is out of hours, so it's relatively easy to get access to computers to do it. That's what they look like. And that's what it looks like when you're doing it. It's a terribly anticlimactic. It's just literally a bag of cells that are being, that are being dripped in and that's Chris and Tony there uh, doing, the, doing the procedure. We don't want to uh, thrombose the portal vein. So we, we do an angiogram to make sure that uh, there's no uh, clots forming there. And that's what an angiogram actually looks like. So I want to turn now to some more of the science behind it all. You've seen the clinical uh, angle of it. Uh, so I want to ask you what's actually known about this condition uh, in Australia. And the answer is not very much. In fact, when we started looking at this, we could find one single case report uh, that had actually been written up in the literature. And when you look at the pancreas um, or the pancreatic um, websites, etc., it's mentioned perhaps in one line, but there really isn't any more information about it after that whatsoever. The largest series uh, in the world is a series of cases uh, in the United States, which is uh, 189 cases. Um, so we asked the question, well, how many are there in, in South Australia? Because uh, Richard Cooper kept saying, well, I've got another one of these. I've got another one of these. And oh, so-and-so's got this. And so there are more there than, than we actually appreciated. So I should mention, this is Deng Hao Wu. He's uh, an honours student of mine, just uh, completed his honours degree at the University of Adelaide uh, and got first class honours. And he's now working as a research as, uh, associate with me uh, to, to build up this cohort of patients in preparation for our Medical Research Futures Fund grant. 
So what he did in his honours degree was construct a, a, a study to look at South Australian um, patients with their probands and their family members. And then he was aiming to uh, look at novel pathogenic uh, variants, because again, no one studied the genes that we've got here in, in, in Australia. And then hopefully look at these that are maybe outside the, the known ones. Perhaps there are some new genes that we might be able to identify that might be different because we're in a different part of the world. I've broken it down very quickly here. He's already identified 89 individuals and that's without really even trying. Um, these are family trees that you can see here, exactly as I said before, they've all, it's all multi-generational, multi-generational. Um, and uh, the other thing that's really very interesting is that people can carry this gene without actually having the pancreatitis features, uh, but they've definitely got the gene. And that ask, uh, begs lots of questions in my mind is what is different about that gene? Why is that gene in that person not giving you pancreatitis, but it is giving you pancreatitis in your son? I don't know. So he's done all of this work to, to, to correct all of this. Uh, and these patients have uh, gone into our uh, uh, pipeline discovery. So this is the smart science bit of it, where we can phenotype these patients and then we extract their, their DNA and do whole exome sequencing. Again, all, all approved, ethically approved uh, via saliva, uh, saliva, and then look at these, do look for variant discovery. And then the aim is to uh, correlate the phenotype with the genotype and see if we can come up with uh, uh, new pathogenic variants. And this is a, an interesting pathway to be doing all of these things because there's, there's a lot of technology now that, the, that we have at SA Pathology. It's one of the best places in the world to be doing this sort of research and linking in with Hamish Scott has enabled us to, again, form these links to, to actually start to, to look at these variants. I'm going to, I'm not bothering, I won't bore you with the, with the details of the, what we found so far, but uh, what's very interesting is that we found a number of genes that, that might potentially uh, have got at least uh, phenotypes or at least characteristics that we know that might be relevant. One of those, for example, this particular mutation, and this is in the PRSS1 gene, uh, produces more inflammatory mediators. This particular gene in the middle here is very important in cell-to-cell -cell communication. So if you've got a, a defect in that gene, you could imagine there might be disruption in how the cells signal and therefore, again, potentially start an inflammatory cycle. And finally, this one over here on the left-hand side, these are all new, never been described before. This new variant gene over here is important in actin binding. So there's a variety of things that might uh, actually be important from, uh, from a physiological point of view. So what he's doing is he's going to expand the cohort. Um, he's looking at... Um, uh, radiological and biochemical data, uh, and he's got a discovery and a validation cohort, and then hopefully we're going to be doing some more in vitro work, funding pretending to, to characterise these variants that we've discovered. Finally, then, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the, the patients that we've actually done, and this is another very talented uh, young medical student. This is Tristan Bapton, who's just graduated from, uh, in fact, he'll be a doctor next, he'll be starting his internship at the Royal Adelaide uh, next year. He's undertaken the data linkage project that I told you about before, so that's been going over the last 20 months, and he's just written up uh, the series of the 16 uh, total pancreatectomy and islet autotransplants for the Australian New Zealand Journal of Surgery. So I'm hoping that Guy might be able to help us uh, uh, get that through over there. Um, to summarise, Royal Adelaide, St Vincent's and Women's and Children's, as our unit has done, 11 of the cases done in Australia so far, and Westmead Children's Hospital and Westmead Adults have done, have done five. Um, the age range is quite uh, uh, dramatic here, so it's hard to read on this slide, and I apologise for that. But we've done children here uh, as young as eight uh, and as young as seven. Uh, there was one done at Westmead who was four. We've also got lots of young adults uh, here in their 17s, 15, 17, and we've done some older people. Not all of them have got the, the hereditary pancreatitis. This procedure also works for chronic pancreatitis. But to me, ethically, uh, if you have a condition that's going to turn malignant and go rogue, if you're going to prioritise who you're going to do, you should be doing them first before you, you use them uh, for other people. But it's still a very, very effective technique from, from, from that point of view. Okay, I'll just highlight what's happened in terms of uh, insulin, in, uh, in terms of uh, opiate requirement, just to give you a bit of a feel for it. Um, before um, these people underwent at least 16, 13 out of the 16 were on regular opiates and adjunctive therapies like the uh, gabapentin that I showed you. Um, after the Australian cohort here, we've got um, uh, only one taking regular opiates and only two taking adjunct, and that's with relatively short uh, um, follow-up. The insulin independence rate for our own group here in South Australia is 53%. So 50% of the people that we do this procedure on, we have got off insulin. Uh, so we've given up islets back to make them insulin independent. And that's important because uh, if you can prevent diabetes, you prevent complications. And complications is what costs for us the health, the health system further down the track. So you can appreciate once we've got this data from data linkage, we should really be able to put some uh, numbers around the outside of it. So 
in cases where we perform this operation early, um, we get much higher islet yields, so we know that. Uh, and if you, if you do it in paediatrics from the international literature, you can get a high insulin uh, independence rate. And our data is, is comparable, probably as good if not, if not better. This procedure is not currently funded. Um, we have a nationally funded centre. South Australia's only nationally funded centre is for islet transplantation, and it's um, up uh, here at the uh, Queen Elizabeth and at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So we wanted to put an application in to, to get this covered. Um, but to do that, it's a very a tough and arduous process, and we really need uh, the data that I've talked about to persuade people that this is a, a cost-effective uh, thing to be done. Uh, what is important, if you think about the United States that only ever does anything for money, um, this procedure is rebated in the United States, whereas islet transplantation, the aloe transplants that we normally do, is not. So what that's telling you is there's big Kaiser Permanente and those, those funds are willing to pay for this because this is value for money. So that's a message that we need to get across to the people that can actually make, this, uh, make this, uh, these decisions. And the other thing that I haven't really stressed in this talk um, is that 50%, 50 percent of the people that we have done in South Australia identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander background, 50 percent. Uh, and uh, in their families, their families are very highly represented. Now you can easily imagine, you don't need me, me to tell you, that if you are a young Indigenous person and you turn up to a public hospital with, a, with pancreatitis, they are not going to assume that you've got hereditary pancreatitis, they're going to assume that you've got something else. So that's a message that uh, I feel quite passionate about and something that we need to get out there is you need to think about this as a diagnosis and once you think about this as a diagnosis and ask, start to ask the questions you'll suddenly discover like we've been discovering families in this state that have got this and uh, know how to manage it they basically sit at home and they don't do anything about it they let the pain go away and they get on with their lives but it's every time they do that pancreas gets worse and gets worse so our MRF application is where we're actually going. So I think it's uh, indicated for the severe cases of pancreatitis, and I will finish in a second, Guy, don't worry. Uh, I can tell you that the patient uh, satisfaction and quality of life um, is, is pretty good. Um, the nice thing about this as a cell therapy is we don't need to purify it because um, it's, it's an autologous therapy and we can certainly get good insulin uh, independence and we can get people off that. So I'd like to put a plug in for the Hospital Research Foundation because we do have a biospheric system that is on its way. Uh, this fund, it was a $1.1 million investment, a philanthropic investment by the Hospital Research Foundation to get us a biospherics chamber. Uh, we're just working on the logistics of uh, building a box in the in SA pathology and this and the machine itself is on its way, well, uh, will be on its way, COVID permitting, um, later in the year, we hope, and there, there's some issues around the outside of that. And there's also been some state government support, but there's absolutely no doubt that without the Hospital Research Foundation and the funds that they have committed to enable us to do this procedure, we would not have the experience that we actually have. So it's a really good example of, uh, of um, uh, philanthropic, uh, philanthropic work. So with any luck, I will finish with this. If I were to describe pancreatitis in one word, it would be excruciating. <laughs> That's the pain of pancreatitis. My name's Chelsea Holloway and at age 11, I was diagnosed with hereditary pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is a condition where your pancreas decides to initially pack up on you and um, become extremely inflamed. So at age 11, when I was initially diagnosed, I was told that there is nothing possible to fix my problem. I had to last with that thought until at least, you know, 16 and a half, 17 years old. I would be taking five to six oxycodones and tremadols daily just to function as a normal person. I was constantly missing out on school, missing work, you know, trying to hang out with my friends was impossible because I was always too unwell. It was around uh, 16, 17 years old when I met Toby um, and we started the process for the total pancreatectomy auto islet transplant. I was in an induced coma for a few days in ICU, you know, getting out of hospital, recovering quite well, which leads me to my life now. I work full time, don't have to have time off. I play in the Premier League netball squad. I can hang out with my friends and family as much or as little as I want to. I'm never in pain. I am completely saved by this surgery. Pancreatitis in my family is hereditary. It comes from my mum's side of the family. If Toby can support me and change my life as much as he has, I'm so excited to see what he can do for others, especially my family in the future. I would like to say thank you 
to all of the doctors, especially Toby Coates, for really pushing um, for this procedure. And I'd like to say a big thank you to the Hospital Research Foundation because without their help and without their funding assistance, Toby Coates wouldn't be able to complete the research that he has today and he wouldn't have been able to restore my life. <laughs>Stand here because we're on Zoom and things here. Um, look, uh, as you can see, why Toby? I'm surprised you only got seventy million dollars after that sort of plug of advertising. And you've, and you've got the politicians here. It's 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 a, well done. But it was a great talk, and it does it does indicate the um, uh, the collaborations that are actually relevant. This is not about manufactured collaborations. This is collaborations you need to make things make things happen. One of the questions, I just before I throw it open, I just want to ask. I mean, this is you know chronic pancreatitis. Uh, hereditary ones lead on to cancer. Is there a literature out there that shows that occasionally in doing this fantastic intervention, we've actually seeded cancer, pancre uh, pancreatic cancer as a result of this, because you're not always going to pick it up on a scan or on even markers. You're, you're absolutely right, Guy. And uh, one of the things that we do is we, we run tumour markers uh, uh, on patients before we do this. And we'd like to try to get in and do this procedure, um, if you like, early on, before they're really likely to develop it because most of the cancers develop in the 40s and the 50s. So you're, you're absolutely right. It's happened once uh, and it happened uh, not in the, this procedure, but in uh, uh, pancreatic, um, uh, somebody who had a cancer at the end of the pancreas, they took the, the cut that out, they kept the, the proximal end, they isolated the islets and they gave it back and unfortunately. Uh, yeah. All right, questions please from the floor, anyone? Yes. Um, now, I think the way we have to do this so they can hear it is we'll repeat the question after it's been asked. Andreas. What's the time frame between surgery and insulin Time frame between surgery and insulin dependence. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's a very good question, independence. Um, it's, uh, it depends really where you're having it done. So uh, if, you are <laughs> if you're having it done at the Women's and Children's, uh, which is a wonderful institution, um, it takes many, many months, and that's because they, they're used to dealing with children with type 1 diabetes, and so they're very gentle at, at actually withdrawing the insulin. If it happens at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where we are, um, we tend to look at the sugars, we look at the C peptides, we say that looks pretty good, uh, and we start cutting back the insulin relatively early. But you're absolutely right, the minimum time is about two weeks because you want those cells to actually embed and not be stressed uh, and, and revascularize, and that's again something that we've learned from the Doing this for, for children at the Yeah, that's a good. That's also a good point. Um, what tends to happen uh, is they essentially become type two diabetics. So they'll end up um, over with a, with for a long period of time. They'll end up being still C peptide positive because remember, there's no autoimmunity here. So we're not actually dealing with the, the, the immune system attacking these islets. So when they, when they die, they die because they're exhausted through age. Um, so what happens is they become, they become insulin, they're glucose intolerant, and then you put them on uh, onto some oral hypoglycemics and, 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 and run it that way. And that certainly happened to at least one of ours, one of the 11 that we've done here um, so far. So yes, it, it, it does happen. I think, and I'll put a plug in for C-peptide, which is my great un, unloved uh, hormone, um, I'm pretty sure that C-peptide does more than just be a tail molecule for making insulin. And there is a literature around this that suggests that it may be important in vascular, uh, remodeling and vascular protection. So provided they're C-peptide positive uh, and you can manage them on a single daily dose of insulin, it's really, or oral hypoglycemics, it's really not too bad. There's a question. Yes, Joy. Um, what I was interested in is, not taking insulin, but taking insulin and then taking so, so the question is, what happens to the islets that get perfused into the liver? Yeah. Um, they basically get embolized into the very small uh, vessels. 
um, and that's where they sit, and then they revascularize and they and they make they make uh, insulin and all the other hormones. Um, occasionally, um, overseas with allo transplants for type one, uh, we've had people um, who've died, and we've been able to uh, get the liver and resect and look at it, and you can see them sitting there sitting there quite quite happily. Um, it's a lovely question, Joy, because um, it's a dreadful place to transplant is the is the liver, and uh, we we actually have active research. Uh, which I didn't talk about today, which is looking at alternative sites for transplantation uh, in, in the skin as, as because we recognize that we lose a lot of cells when we do this. So it's, having said that, this is how we do it at the moment. It works. And so we keep going yeah. until, until we can find somewhere better. Uh, yes, Sue. So the question is, uh, in South Australia, because we're so incestuous, um, it's, um, it's possible often to get back to uh, very source uh, individuals. Um, so that's the question, Tony. Absolutely. And uh, when you talk to these Indigenous uh, families, um, there, there is an elder um, who was met about eight generations ago, who they will say is where this came from. Uh, but obviously, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a story and that's a good story. And uh, as far as we can tell, the other nice thing about doing the genetic analysis, of course, is we could look at a degree of relatedness that's easily done with whole exome sequencing. So when we've got all the families together, we should be able to actually build a bit of a better map. Having said all that, um, you know, what I, again, what I didn't point out was that we've had people come to Adelaide from Western Australia, to Adelaide from uh, Queensland and New South Wales, and we've almost got one coming from Victoria to access this treatment here. We've got Indigenous families that have come from uh, New South Wales as well, so they're probably not going to be related. So I do think I think there's another story there that we need to we need to carefully dissect, and I think the sociological things that I described before are extremely important and an aspect of this uh, project that uh, needs to be followed up. Paul. So, I mean, where, where else uh, in the South Hemisphere is this done? We're the only two places uh, in the Southern Hemisphere doing this. Uh, no Islet program uh, exists in Japan. There's 7,000 wealthy Japanese waiting to come to the Intercontinental Hotel and have this procedure done at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, so there's, there's potential for that to actually happen. There's, uh, there's nothing in China uh, that's doing this, as far as I'm aware. Um, and there's certainly nothing in the rest of Southeast Asia. So there's an opportunity, I think, if we can build up expertise to become a, you know, a regional centre to deal with our, our population through Medicare, which is ultimately the plan to get this uh, Medicare uh, reimbursed, uh, but then also um, for people to access this sort of technology um, here in Adelaide um, flying in. Paul. So the, the, the gap, the still a gap, it's not covered by Medicare. Correct. Correct. So um, what the Hospital Research Foundation has funded essentially the isolations. And the isolations cost $38,000 which is actually a pretty good value uh, for what you actually get, considering the complexity of the rest of it. Everything else we do uh, is, in inverted commas, activity-based, meaning that you can, you can provide it, you are, um, what's the word, licensed or uh, accredited, allowed, or accredited, accredited or, yeah, or one yeah, of those words, yeah. um, to, uh, to do this procedure. There's, there's, a, there's a pancreatectomy, there's, a, there's an MBS number, infusions, there are MBS numbers, theatre time, that's all covered. It's the bit that's missing is the isolation of the cells, and that's... Uh, that's what uh, HRF has been supporting us to do. So the question is, what is the success rate of the transplantation? 100% C peptide positive. So every time we've transplanted the uh, islets in this situation, we cells have survived out to a significant period of time. Now that tells me the cellular transplant works. The, the better, the, the other question that goes with it, of course, is whether or not that's enough to come off insulin. And that's why I say in, in us, our, our series is about 53%, which is, which is very, very good, very much better can, than what's been published. So th that's the functional side of it. The other thing that I would point out is that uh, when, you've got these, when you've got the islet cells there, you also get this, the counter-regulatory hormones, you get uh, glucagon and that sort of thing. So the diabetes, even if you don't become <coughs> insulin independent, is much more manageable. If you'd have a pancreatectomy, as I'm sure Guy would attest, without replacement of the beta cells, you produce a terrible type three diabetes, which is extremely brittle and difficult to control. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So the question is how important is fresh islets? And it's very important. It is. Yeah. They, don't, they don't freeze, unfortunately. Um, so we can't actually cryobank them. We wish we could. Um, if, for example, we went across to Melbourne and, uh, and the planes were on strike or, uh, you know, or the, there was another volcano erupt or something like that, then we would culture the cells overnight because you can culture them for about a, a, anywhere up to a week and then you'd be able to ship them back by road if you had to. Uh, but that's clearly a, a much better option would be to isolate them here and not have any of this um, palaver going on. And, and that's, again, where we're going with the, with the Research Foundation and hopefully the MRFF. Last question. So, so the question is, uh, will we solve our state debt by bringing Japanese tourists to have this procedure done? <laughs> Thank you, Austin. Lovely question. Um, look, it, it, you know, again, it's uh, uh, when we do an aloe transplant, uh, that is for type 1 diabetes, um, uh, you, the taxpayer, uh, pay us $180,000 per procedure. That's what it costs. So um, I don't personally, um, I'm not in the... I, I don't wish to save, save the state's economic uh, um, problems with, with this procedure because I think this is a procedure that's to be done for the benefit of people. Uh, I think we could bring that cost down probably to something of the order of $50,000. Uh, and you might want to add a little bit on there for you know, a bit of infrastructure or something like that or another University of Adelaide room for us. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's, it, it, it's not by all, it's nothing like the, the aloe transplant because you only need one, one pancreas and not, not the three of them. And, uh, and essentially, what you what you isolate is what you give back. There's no purification, uh, and it all goes back in. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much technically easier thing to do. All right. Well, look. On that note, we'll um, uh, adjourn once again, Toby. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, we, we, we